Okay, today's lecture, um, or this afternoon's lecture, is on the topic of the gold standard in theory and in myth. And the mythology of gold, as we might call it, really grew up with John Maynard Keynes. Okay? Actually, myths were starting to develop, to develop about the gold standard even before Keynes wrote in the 1930s. Uh, they began to grow up um, with the quantity theorists at the turn of the century, including Irving Fisher. Uh, in today's world, in the post-World War II era, the, the uh, mythology of gold substitutes for any sort of sound analysis of the gold standard. So what I want to do is to, to, to give some of the more prominent myths and then to show how they are not um, based on sound theoretical reasoning, at least from the Austrian point of view. And then I want to talk a little bit about the, the plans for a transition back to the um, gold standard and some of the difficulties that we will face in such an endeavor. Let me just show you some of these myths. I think it's ready. Okay, these are the six myths I'll deal with. The first is that the gold standard is unable to accommodate the monetary needs of a growing economy. Since our economy is growing from year to year, um, it is said that we require an increased money supply to accommodate the exchange of these additional goods. Secondly, um, under the gold standard, the quantity of money is arbitrarily determined. That is, it's determined by the costs of, of, of mining and um, by other factors that may influence the demand for money. Or rather, the demand for the use of the demand for the use of gold as a non-monetary commodity. Okay. It's not in any sense planned in a rational way. That's what they mean. That's what, what this is uh, means to say. Thirdly, the gold standard is a government price-fixing scheme writ large. This is a particularly monetarist critique that setting a fixed price of gold between the dollar and uh, a unit of gold is nothing but a price-fixing scheme. And um, why would Austrians who believe so passionately in a free market fall victim to, or, or advocate such a scheme? Fourth, the international gold standard subjects a country to alternating bouts of inflation and deflation. That is, the money supply depends um, almost solely on what is happening to the balance of payments in a country. So if you have a surplus in the balance of payments, gold flows in, your money supply increases. Whereas a deficit will result in a contraction of the money supply. And with corresponding effects on the price levels of those countries. Fifth, the gold standard involves high costs in terms of resources devoted to gold mining, as well, and, and even more importantly, as a sacrifice of productive uses of gold in industry, for example, in electronics, uh, in dentistry, uh, in jewelry. And sixth and last, the gold standard results in high interest rates that discourage investment and retard economic growth. This was a particular crit um, critique of Keynes of the gold standard. Well, I think basic supply and demand analysis in most cases will show us that these are certainly just myths okay, and are not correct representations of, of how the gold standard actually works. So let me start with the first myth, the fact that the gold standard is unable to accommodate the um, needs of a growing economy. Uh, we might begin by pointing out that the decade in which we've had one of the greatest um, rates of growth in the United States was in the 1880s. Okay, and I have some statistics here uh, regarding that. So, historically, it's certainly not true that the gold standard stunted growth. Um, in fact, throughout the 19th century and up until World War II, a mild deflationary trend prevailed in the industrialized nations. So, despite the rapid growth that occurred as, as country after country industrialized in, in the 19th century, we had a, um, a gold standard in place. And this certainly didn't prevent that rapid growth. Uh, to go on, um, 
the reason for this was that the supply of goods did outstrip the supply of, 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 of gold money. And yet there, there, was, there was growth and falling prices at the same time. And for example, in the U.S. from 1880 to 1896, the wholesale price level fell by about 30% in 16 years. That's about 1.7% per year. And those figures come from uh, Friedman and Swartz. At the same time that the price level was declining, okay, after the U.S. had gone back to gold in 1879, uh, at the same time that we had this decline in, in the uh, price level, real income rose by about 85% or around 5% per year. Okay, one of the, the most rapid, prolonged rates of growth in U.S. history. Uh, aside from infrequent discoveries of major new sources of gold, this inflationary trend was only interrupted during periods of major wars, such as the Napoleonic Wars um, that Britain fought. And from, as I said, 1797 to 1821, Britain had gone off the gold standard and, as a result, did experience rapid inflation. And also, of course, the U.S. Uh, during the Civil War. Okay, but yet, after they returned to the gold standard, prices then continued to fall. And that didn't impede growth. Well, that's the history of it. Okay, and there are many other instances of increases uh, in, in or uh, high rates of growth coinciding with, with the gold standard. But what about the theory? Well, the theory um, can be explained, I think, with a simple supply and demand diagram in which we put the money total stock of money in the economy on the horizontal axis and the purchasing power of money, the value of a money unit, or to put it another way, uh, the amount of, of, of various units of goods that can be purchased by a unit of money, we put that on the price axis, that's equal to 1 over P. So, for example, if you pay $10 for um, a compact disc, well then the value of, of of money in terms of the compact disk is one-tenth of a compact disk. If a, comp if a computer, a personal computer costs uh, or has a price of $1,000, well then the value of, mo of money of a dollar in terms of personal computers is one-thousandth, one-one-thousandth of, of, of a personal computer. So as we said earlier in the week, uh, the purchasing power of money is a, a, an array of alternative quantities of goods that can be purchased by uh, a unit of money, in this case, the dollar. So let's take a simple example. Let's say the quantity of gold at a given point in time is fixed, and so we draw a vertical supply of money, M. Okay. Well, let's have MS for money supply. And we have a certain demand for money, a certain amount of money that people wish to hold and wish to purchase with their labor and other goods that they're selling. And let's say that the money supply in, in, in billions of dollars is $100 billion. Okay. Now, what would happen if suddenly we had um, a 10% increase in the supplies of goods and services produced in this economy? Well, um, in effect, the sellers of those goods would want to sell those goods okay, at, at going prices. That would mean you would need 10% more money to be able, for the economy to be able to absorb those goods. So, in effect, Okay, if this is the money demand before growth, M1, MD1, in effect what would occur is that the demand for money would increase. So now the demand for money would be 10% greater. Okay, so now you would have quantity demanded for money at the, given pro at the given purchasing power of money, at the given amount that money can purchase, PPM1, it would now be $110 billion. But there's no Fed to create this additional $10 billion that we need. So how did the gold standard handle that? Very simply, okay. If I can direct your attention for a moment to the high-tech industries in the last 20 to 30 years, how did they handle the fact that the supply of personal computers and, and uh, software and so on was increasing so rapidly that it was outstripping even the inflationary rate of growth of the money supply caused by the Fed? in the 80s and 90s. Well, what, how, how did those additional computers get sold? The point is that because of the technological advances and increase in investment in those industries, costs fell. So that when these supplies of computers increased on the market, their prices fell. So, um, to, again, to give you 
an idea of the magnitude of this fall, um, we can go back to history, uh, recent history in this case, and um, let's see if I have the statistics here. I think I, I believe I do. Yes, I do. Um, a mainframe computer sold for $4.7 million in 1970, okay? While today one can purchase a personal, uh, a personal computer that is 20 times faster for less than $1,000, okay? So we had a substantial price deflation in high-tech industries, and that did not impair the growth in those industries, the, this fall in prices, because it corresponded to falling costs due to technological advances. Uh, in fact, um, we, can, we can point out that the, there was an enormous expansion of profits, productivity, and outputs in these industries. This is reflected in the fact that in 1980, computer firms shipped a total of just about one-half million PCs, while in 1999, their shipments exceeded 43 million units, so it increased 86 times. All right? And that's despite the fact that quality-adjusted prices had fallen by over 90%. So the point is here, as people bring their goods to market, there's been an increase in the supply of goods because there's been technological improvement, as I said, at lower costs. They bring these goods to market. What happens is exactly what happens in the high-tech industries, except it happens economy-wide. Or not necessarily economy-wide, um, in those industries in which you have growth. So their prices will begin to fall. As their prices fall, each dollar will be able to purchase more of that particular good than it did before. So, there's an excess demand for money, a shortage, so-called shortage of money, but it's only temporary on the market. What happens is that as the value of each dollar increases, we move up along the demand curve to this point. So that at the end of the process, prices are 10% lower, or roughly 10% lower, and the purchasing power of money is roughly 10% higher. Okay? So, each gold dollar can now purchase 10% more than it did before. Now, what does that mean? If you look at the total amount of goods that can be purchased, for example, if we have a situation where the good was originally, let's say, um, $10, right? So that means that, that a dollar could purchase one tenth, and now it's $11. So now the, the, the dollar can purchase, uh, I'm sorry, $9, excuse me. The dollar can purchase approximately 10% um, more. Uh, what happens is that the real supply of money increases. The real supply of money is the money supply over the prices. So if we take um, this, this particular good, initially we had a money supply of $100 billion, and we had a price of 10. So the number of units that could be purchased by that money supply was $10 billion. But as the price falls, okay, I'll move it over. Oh, I hit the button. Thank you. Okay. There we go. If it falls to, to the $9, the same $100 billion of gold, okay, which hasn't changed, there's no Fed, okay, increasing the money supply, um, can now purchase over or around 11 billion units of the good. So you don't, the, the, the market process will adjust the purchasing power of money so as to enable the additional goods and services to be sold on the market. And they will be sold profitably on the market because costs are also falling. Okay? That is the reason for economic growth. So that's the simple supply and demand, or the basic supply and demand theory that shows that the first argument against the gold standard is purely a myth. Okay? It's refuted by theory and by history. All right, what about two? Under the gold standard, the quantity of money is arbitrarily determined. And what the Keynesians and monetarists generally mean by this is it's not determined by some central government agency that decides that the economy demands for more money and therefore they will rationally supply this additional money. Um, under the gold standard, as in the case of any other commodity on the market, costs of production in conjunction with demand, determine the quantity of money. Okay. So I gave you an example here of 
the um, gold standard at a particular point in time. But if you look over a prolonged period of time, you'll find that the supply of gold does react to an increase in demand for gold. It takes a while to do that. So we have the purchasing power of money here again, and we have the whatever the purchasing power may be at a given point in time, the equilibrium purchasing power, and a certain money supply here. Let's just call it M1 as, as the money supply. This is the money supply. This is the money demand. M is the quantity of money at a given point in time. All right, let's say for a moment that there is a decrease in, in the cost of supplying gold. Okay? A better technique is, is discovered for abstracting gold from the ore. Or possibly uh, better mines are found, okay, from which it's easy to extract the gold. For, that, for whatever reason now, you suddenly have a decrease in the cost of mining gold. Um, well, what would that mean? That would mean now that you would have an increase in the supply of gold, as in, in any other, the case of any other industry in the economy. So you would have a shift to the right of the supply curve to MS prime, let's say. You'd have more gold in the economy, and as a result, prices would rise. Okay, purchasing power, two. Now, how would this come about? Okay. What would happen is that as the price of extracting gold from the ground dropped, that would mean that you would have a, a, um, a situation where an ounce of gold could be pur purchased from the ground, could be gotten from the ground for less than an ounce of gold that you have to pay in wages. Okay. So now you would have higher, more workers, okay, paying them the going wage rates, and there'll be a higher profit, in other words, to producing gold. Just as it would be uh, if the price of apples fell or if the price of computers fell. You would expand the industry. And, and, and so gold mining would expand, and what, you, what would happen is that more gold would come out of the ground, and the price of gold, or the, the value of gold would drop. In other words, there'd be more gold in circulation and drive prices up. But that's um, not, not the only, or not the end of the effect. Some of that additional gold... Okay, since gold is now cheaper, okay, um, as the price of, for example, of, 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 of jewelry goes up and so on, it, it would now be more, more um, profitable to produce jewelry and more profitable to use gold in dentistry because those prices have risen. So part of the new gold would go to directly satisfying consumer wants and part of it would go into the money supply. In either case, you would have a higher price level but you would also have more goods that would be produced by gold. Okay? So society would benefit. Okay. That's, that, that would occur with any, any sort of, of a, a, a particular um, uh, good, whether it's, it's gold or any other type of commodity. Now, why is that arbitrary? Why do they say that the quantity of money is arbitrarily determined? It's not arbitrarily determined. It's determined by the market. On the other hand, I won't draw it here, if you had an increase in the demand for gold, prices would fall. Okay? And as prices fell, the prices of those inputs or resources that you use to mine gold would fall. So you'd have a fall in, um, in, in the price of capital goods, a fall in the prices of the various raw materials and energy that you use to mine gold. What would, what, what would that do to gold production? In the long run, it would be more profitable to, to, to mine gold from the existing mines using the existing techniques. So um, when there's an increase in demand for gold, in the short run, yes, prices fall. But in the longer run, what tends to happen? As those prices fall, it spurs or stu excuse me, stimulates the um, uh, development of new sources of gold and also stimulates the production from existing gold mines. And as a result, you get an increase in the, in, in the supply of gold that pushes prices up back towards their former level. Now, what's so arbitrary about that? Okay, that's not arbitrary. Basically, what, what the, the critics of gold call um, arbitrary simply means that the quantity of gold is not determined by governments. 
It's determined by people's demands for gold, and it's determined by the cost, the, tech, uh, the cost of gold, based on technology and the availability of, of, of specific resources such as gold mines. Okay. I don't see that as arbitrary uh, one, one bit. Okay. Thirdly, what about this whole idea that gold is a, a, a government price-fixing scheme okay, on, a, on, a, on a large level? Okay. Um, this is a particular criticism of, by Milton Friedman of the gold standard. But in fact, under a genuine gold standard, there is, it's not price fixing. Um, if we go back to the 19th century, when we had genuine gold standards existing in most of the world, or silver standards, but let's focus on gold, um, we had a situation where for uh, at least for about 100 years in the U U.S., from 1834 until 1933, the dollar was defined legally as equal to one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Okay, that's not price fixing. When people brought their gold into banks, um, that meant that there was a they, they formed a contract with the bank to to uh, to re, to return their property when they redeemed the, the, the um, banknote. The banknote itself was not money under a genuine gold standard. It was a, a receipt that permitted you to redeem, your, uh, to redeem that note for money. You could use it as a money substitute in exchange because it was more convenient. But it itself was not the money, and people understood that. Okay. It's as if someone says... Um, the 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 pink slip that uh, the uh, the uh, um, the title to an automobile which which changes hands. You I can sell you my automobile my uh, my 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 Grand Prix <laughs> competition series. Um, I can sell you that, and uh, here in Alabama give you the pink slip, and the car could remain in New Jersey. I could store it for you for a few months. Okay, um, I'd beat it into the ground at that point. But anyway, <laughs> you uh you would. You wouldn't be deluded into believing that the pink slip, the so-called pink slip, which is the title to the car, is the car itself. Okay, obviously it's a title to the car. All right. So having keeping that in mind, when all nations were on on, on the gold standard, everybody had the same money. Okay, they just used different names to uh, designate their unit of money. So, for example, the British pound was equal to one-fourth of an ounce of gold. Okay. The French franc was equal to one-hundredth of an ounce of gold, and so on. So, for about a hundred years, the U.S. dollar, the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar was $4.86 per one British pound. Okay. Why was that? That wasn't arbitrary. There was no price fixing there. The reason why that exists is because there was five times the amount of gold in a British pound, since it was one fourth, defined as one fourth of an ounce, as there was in, Ameri in an American dollar, which was defined as one twentieth of an ounce. So, under the gold standard, the fixed exchange rates between the different goods is no different than the fixed exchange rate. Okay, it's not really an exchange rate, but we'll call it that for the moment. The fixed exchange rate between, let's say, um, a nickel okay, and a quarter. A nickel is defined as one-twentieth of a dollar. A quarter is defined as one-quarter of a dollar or one-fourth of a dollar. Therefore, five nickel, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one-twentieth of a dollar. Yeah, five nickels exchange for one-quarter. That's not an exchange rate. That's not a government price-fixing scheme. That, that's simply a result of the laws of arithmetic. Okay? So, um, Friedman is wrong under at least a genuine gold standard. Now, that's not true of the Bretton Woods system. And we'll talk about some other gold standards in which it would be, uh, there, it would be artificial price-fixing. But under a genuine gold standard, it is not a price-fixing scheme. Okay. Fourth, the international gold standard subjects a country to alternating bouts of inflation and deflation. For example, if um, the U.S. were to run a surplus under the gold standard, gold would flow into the country 
it would um, increase the money supply and drive prices up. The country that was losing gold, that had the deficit, let's say that was Great Britain, would find that its money supply is shrinking because gold is flowing out of the country and therefore its prices are falling. But we have to ask ourselves, why, does, uh, the, uh, why do these um, deficits and surpluses occur? Are they an act of God? Well, no, of course not. Okay? Let's take the United States. The United States, just as the world was under the gold standard, the United States today is a single currency area using dollars. Do we um, worry about or even know whether, for example, New Jersey has a deficit or a surplus with California, or whether Nebraska has a deficit or a surplus with Indiana? Fortunately, state governments don't keep those kinds of statistics, so no one worries about them. If they did, of course, then we'd have pro people would be worrying about the balance of payments you know, from their t in their town and, and so on. Okay? The point is this. Let's say that... Um, yeah, there's uh, an increase in output in California, okay? an increase in productivity uh, because of the high-tech industries in Silicon Valley. Okay? Well, that's, a, that's a good example, I would say. And on the other hand, there's a, a fall in output in, um, or a fall in demand for output from Michigan because uh, U.S. cars are no longer in demand. Well, Michigan's imports, or I'm sorry, Michigan's exports, the things that they sell to the rest of the country, would begin to decline. Uh, on the other hand, California's exports to the rest of the country, the computers and, 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 and software they sell, the would, would increase. Okay. Michigan's, Michigan's um, um, citizens and so on would find that they had fewer dollars as their incomes fell. California's citizens, on the other hand, would find they had more dollars. So money would be redistributed from Michigan to California. But that's not deflation. That's, or uh, deflation in Michigan, inflation in California. That's simply a result of the fact that, that the demand for output in a certain area has fallen, and therefore people's incomes in that area have fallen, and people want to hold less money when their incomes are less, so that the money supply falls. It's a voluntary action on the part of the people of Michigan who are losing income. Okay? Uh, you know, think about it. If your income was cut in half, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, but if it's cut in half, you're not going to hold as much cash anymore. Okay? So cash is going to flow out from your, out, your household for a while until you have the proper reduced amount that maximizes your utility. Um, your household is going to have a deficit. Okay? If you lose your job or, 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 or if you take a pay cut. On the other hand, if, if your household enjoys an increase in income, uh, then because of, of the, the higher value of, the, of your labor that you're selling, you're going to find that, that, that money's going to flow in. You're going to hold a greater amount of money. Money's going to be redistributed, and always is, continually, from minute to minute, from those areas that are losing, um, that who's the, the demand for whose products are falling, to those areas where the demand for the, their products are rising. As Hayek pointed out, that's not deflation or inflation, because deflation or inflation means a, uh, an increase or a fall in the money supply in a closed area, okay? So if the, if the U.S. is a dollar area and the number of dollars in the U.S. falls, then you have monetary deflation. Or if it rises, you have monetary inflation. Now, what's the closed area under the gold standard? It's not one country, okay? Every country, every country's money, despite the names that they use, the differing names, every country's money is, in fact, gold. So the reason why, for example, Great Britain would lose um, gold to the U.S. under a genuine pure gold standard would be because the productivity in the U.S. is increasing faster than in Great Britain. Or let's say um, demand has shifted from textiles from Great Britain, world demand, to uh, uh, wheat. So wheat would be more valuable here in the U.S. Farmers' incomes would rise in the U.S. and that would be reflected in an increase in the amount of gold that they hold. On the other hand, those people in the British textile industries, the stockholders and workers, would find their incomes are falling. And when your incomes fall, you hold less money. Okay, it's natural. So it's just a redistribution of gold within a closed system. Countries don't have alternating bouts of, of deflation and inflation. In fact, that occurs when you begin to get paper money uh, pyramided on top of the gold standard. Then, if gold flows out, not only do you, you lose, let's, let, let's say you, you uh, lose $1 million worth of gold, but then what happens is that the banks, as they lose gold, then have to decrease their loans and decrease the amount of paper money. 
And what that does is to exacerbate the outflow. And Hayek pointed that out also. So it's fractional reserve banking that causes the added deflation or added inflation. It's not the gold standard itself. Under a pure gold standard, um, the, the whole world is a closed system, and as, as part of the world gets richer faster than other parts of the world, gold flows away from the parts that are, are lagging behind to those parts uh, in which the um, income is increasing. The gold itself doesn't cause people to be richer or poorer, the inflow of gold. It's a result of, of that. Okay. And it's the same thing with, with your household, right? If, if your income increases, it's because your good, whatever you're selling has become more valuable. And therefore, what, what the consequence of that is that you get an increase in your money income. And you hold the larger proportion, or you hold more money income over the year than you would have. Okay. All right, what about the fifth um, objection to the gold standard? that it allegedly involves extremely high costs in terms of resources. Um, resources both that are used to mine new gold as well as the opportunity cost of using gold not in jewelry or dentistry or in electronics but using it as money. Okay? Adam Smith was one of the first economists to claim that the gold standard had a high resource cost. Um, believe it or not, the early Ludwig von Mises actually accepted this. Um, what Adam Smith said was the following. Replacing gold with paper money is like replacing a highway that goes through fertile land with a highway in the sky. Okay, so he used that analogy. Because a highway in the sky wouldn't cause, wouldn't have the opportunity cost of causing land that could have been used to grow various, good, uh, various crops now to be used for a road. Okay? And the materials that are used in the road could also be used for other uses. So what Smith basically said was this. As we, now he was, he was in favor of a gold standard, but he wanted, um, he wanted a fractional reserve gold standard. He was very comfortable with that. He says, as we print more paper money and drive prices up in Great Britain, we send gold out of the country in exchange for capital goods. And that makes us more productive. So the paper money, in effect, allows us to create capital goods by pushing gold out to foreign countries in exchange for these capital goods that make our labor more productive. Okay, so that was this <coughs> argument. Um, the French economists um, always rejected that argument. And later on, von Mises did, and of course Rothbard did. Uh, there's a couple of, of um, responses to this argument. Okay, The first response is, well, even if gold standard has high, high resource costs, um, those high resource costs are justified as a way of preventing the government from inflating. If you lived in a, a, wor a world where, uh, let's say, you, you could trust governments, right, which is you know, a never-never land, um, not to inflate the money supply, not to do what's natural and, and try to increase spending and buy votes by simply printing new money, okay? So if you lived in that kind of world, all right, well, then you might say, well, we really don't need a gold, need a gold standard. We don't live in that kind of a world, okay? Uh, economists in the 19th century used to look on the gold standard as golden handcuffs. To c they tie the hands of government and prevent the government from printing new money. Okay? It's like saying, you know, if we could just get rid of, um, well, let's put it this way, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's very high resource costs. There's a lot of resources tied up in, in, in steel bicycle um, locks. Okay? If we got rid of the steel bicycle locks and simply put a piece of paper around it and wrote lock on it, <laughs> what, 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 wouldn't we have all the steel to produce other things that are useful to human beings? Okay? Well, if we lived in a world where no one stole bicycles, yeah, sure. That's, that's, not, that's not the case in New Jersey. Okay? <laughs> we, we put two locks on our bikes. Um, all right. Okay, so first of all, even if there are high resource costs, Okay, it's, uh, think about it, think of it as buying insurance against inflation. Okay, but secondly, as, as Roger Garrison has pointed out, um, we have, a, you know, these are economists that are making the, the, this point, and yet they're not taking into the, into, into, um, the uh, uh, um, into account 
the alternatives. Okay, remember you have to compare institutions. What about the resource costs of paper money that is, is that causes the economy to go through a business cycle in which you have inflation and misdirection of capital that is then revealed in a recession and layoffs of workers. Okay, I would venture to say the resource costs that we've suffered from paper money business cycles, business cycles that are induced by paper money, are greater than the um, resource costs of a gold standard. Okay, But beyond that, and actually this is Roger Garrison's point, um, what happened in the when we had stagflation in the 1970s and, um, and, uh, and beyond, when we, when we had um, crises in, in the 1980s, when we had financial crises, what do people do when they're confronted with rapid inflation or, or, or fear of, of, of bank collapses and, and financial collapses? Well, they rush out and they buy gold, don't they? And in fact, in the late 1970s, the price of gold shot up to around $800 an ounce. What did that do to the amount of resources in gold mining? It pushed more resources into gold mining. Okay. Um, why? Because people wanted to use gold as a hedge. So governments haven't gotten rid of their gold. All governments hold, hold big stocks of gold. They haven't. I don't see government selling that gold off, allowing the market to use that gold to produce more um, you know, uh, products for dentistry, uh, more electronics, and so on. Okay? In fact, the stocks of, of, of gold held now out of production may be greater than they were under the gold standard. Resources devoted to gold mining might be greater. You don't know what would happen under the gold standard. So, first, so, so we can respond is, first of all, even if, they, if it is high, that is resource costs, it's, it's a form of insurance against government inflation. Two, government uh, fiat money inflation has caused um, a repetition of the business cycle okay, to recur again and again. Uh, and that has resource costs. No, and no monitors has tried to add that up okay, and compare that to the resource costs of gold. Though they, they, they have come up with figures, Friedman has and others have, of, of, of what the resource costs of gold are, but you want to compare it to something, to the alternative institution. And finally, paper money doesn't, doesn't save on the resource costs of gold because people use gold as a hedge. It's the first hedge against inflation or against crisis. All right, lastly, uh, the gold standard results in high interest rates that discourage investment and retard economic growth. Basically, this is a Keynesian criticism. Again, if you have a gold standard, especially a genuine pure gold standard, it's impossible for the Fed to increase bank reserves and push down interest rates, bringing about a business cycle. And we know in the short run in a business cycle, you do seem to get a boom in output. And that's what they're talking about. That you could, you know, Alan Greenspan would not be able to manipulate interest rates. Well, I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing not to have overinvestment. All right. So um, basically, the, the response to that is that um, we don't want low interest rates if low interest rates are the result of manipulation by central banks, because low interest rates result in misallocation of resources and eventual recession. Okay. So those are, are my critiques of the, um, goals, of the um, objections to the gold standard. Um, let's talk about returning to the gold standard. So I think this is an interesting and important and um, unresolved area of the theory of the gold standard. The thing that we do not want to do is to return to what uh, we might call a pseudo gold standard or a phony gold standard. Because when that breaks down, and Brett, like when Bretton Woods broke down, they will blame, that is the Keynesians and monetarists and other, others, uh, will blame the gold standard for the breakdown. So, if you return to a gold standard, you want to go back to a genuine gold standard. All right. So let's look at some of these um, plans to return to pseudo gold standards. When um, Alan Greenspan first took office as, as chairman of the Fed, um, he and others uh, uh, on the board of governors of the Fed, Wayne Angel being someone else, began to talk about using the price of gold as one of a number of indicators of inflation. Okay, or deflation, uh, along with some other commodity prices. Um, so if the price of gold was suddenly rising, 
That would indicate to, to Greenspan and, and, and the others in, uh, on the Federal Open Market Commission, or Federal Open Market Committee, excuse me, that there was a fl- inflation that is imminent in the, in the U.S. economy. So that would uh, indicate to them, ideally, that they should drain reserves from the banking system and uh, uh, slow down the rate of growth in the money supply. Uh, well, it's not a real gold standard. Just, just looking at gold as one price among, uh, among many um, is certainly not a, a, a real gold standard. Um, and so we can criticize it as re- it really does leave, still leave the monopoly of money squarely in the hands of the Fed. Okay? It's just, it's just another indicator to them. They're using it as an indicator. Also, um, the, it makes central bank policy gold-plated, meaning that it's not a true gold standard. There's not a gold standard under there, but it opens a gold standard for criticism. All right? And um, so, so gold can be blamed for the inevitable failure of this. Now, we came a little bit closer in the early 1980s to a gold standard. President Reagan's advisors, the supply siders, most prominently Arthur Laffer, Robert Mundell, and Jack Kemp, okay, and other writers at the um, Wall Street Journal, um, were pushing for what they called a new Bretton Woods, okay, which was a distorted form of the gold standard in which only the U.S. dollar was, was as I said, convertible into gold, and then only for foreign governments and, in, and, and official institutions, not for American citizens. Okay? So, it was, and plus, of course, there would be no gold coin in circulation and so on. So they were pushing Reagan to institute a new Bretton Woods. And in fact, Reagan did um, convene a commission okay, on, uh, to study this question. Um, and uh, they held hearings. And it was dominated, of course, by monetarists and other right-wing Keynesian Republican economists. And they came out, the majority report came out against instituting a new gold standard. Um, Murray Rothbard was asked to testify, and um, he uh, gave a talk uh, and was part of the, one of the people that, that um, uh, wrote up the minority report. Okay? Uh, I think George Reisman also testified before Congress on this point. And again, he was one of the few that argued for going back to a genuine gold standard. All right, what was the blueprint, though, that these supply-siders okay, uh, um, set forth? Uh, one thing about the supply-siders, they want sound money and plenty of it. Okay? So they want a gold standard, but they want a lot of money. They want money to be, you know, they want a gold standard that can be inflated in some, in some sense. Okay? Uh, well, the first, this, this is called the Laffer blueprint. He wrote a blueprint on this, Arthur Laffer. Um, he, he wants the Fed to convert dollars into gold at, at a fixed price, okay, uh, a range. Okay, so now this is a price, this is a price fixing scheme. He wanted the Fed to fix the price of gold at, let's say, $400 per ounce, plus or minus $10. So, if suddenly the price of gold began to rise towards $410, that would indicate to the supply siders who believe that gold was a very sensitive indicator of what was going to happen to the rest of the prices in the economy very quickly, they would look on, on that rise of the price of gold as uh, a warning that inflation was about to break out. And at that point, then, they would go out into the market and they would, um, they would uh, sell gold and dollars would come in, uh, would, would return, and the monetary, uh, the uh, money supply would, would be reduced. Okay. On the other hand, if the price of gold fell towards three hundred and ninety dollars, that meant that uh, we were uh, going to have uh, an inflation. Or there was an impending uh, uh, impending deflation. Excuse me. And the way to, to, uh, they would react, the Fed in that case, would be to, to go into the market, print dollars, and buy gold to drive the price back up to four hundred dollars. Okay. So now gold really takes the place of government securities as you know, in open market operations. If you want to increase the money supply, well, you print dollars up and you buy gold. If you want to decrease the money supply, you sell do- gold for dollars, okay? And you try to keep the price fixed at around $400. Also, they, they put in here, which they didn't really need, um, that there would be a, what was called a target reserve quantity, that 40% of the Fed's liabilities had to be covered by gold. So the, so the Fed would, would have gold backing up 40% of its liabilities which meant 40% of currency in circulation plus bank reserves. Okay? 
Um, and then the Fed would retain full discretion in monetary policy as long as this target reserve quantity of gold um, was within 10% of 40%. So in other words, as long as it was plus or minus, 40% plus or minus 10%. What would happen if um, the amount of gold suddenly fell, meaning that there was inflation, uh, below 30%? Okay. Well, then at that point, the Fed could not... Uh, its liabilities would be frozen. It could, not, it could not create any more reserves. It was an attempt to, to force the Fed to restrict its, its inflation. Okay? If, it fell, um, if, its, if its liabilities fell below, uh, or I'm sorry, if the um, gold um, backing fell below 20% of its liabilities, then they had to reduce the monetary base by 1% per year. In other words, they had to begin to reduce, actually reduce the money supply. Um, and finally, if the uh, target reserve quantity fell below 10% of the Fed's liabilities, well, what would happen? Nothing. What would happen would be, well, you have to raise the price of gold now. Okay? So there was no punishment for inflating to the point where the, uh, the, the, they began to lose their gold stock. Okay? So uh, this was not a real gold standard. Okay, this was a phony gold standard. It was a price-fixing scheme. In fact, some of the supply-siders later on said, you know what, we don't even have to buy and sell gold or keep gold. All we have to do is look at the price of gold. So if the price of gold went towards $410, we'll simply take government securities, sell them on the market, absorb some of the dollars, and, and bring the price of gold back to $400. Okay? Uh, and, and if we had a deflation, we would do the opposite. We'd go out and we'd, we'd print money and we'd buy securities. Okay, so that um, gold didn't need to be what they call the intervention asset. Okay, so they're, they're talking in, in, in um, bureaucratic, technocratic terms. Okay, they had no intention of allowing gold to be the medium, real medium of exchange. Okay. Well, it could be the intervention asset, the asset that you buy and sell to keep the price of gold fixed, or you could use government securities. It didn't matter. Okay? And one of these um, uh, supply siders who happened to be my professor at Rutgers when I was getting my PhD was named, um, uh, his name was, was Mark Miles. He wrote a book on, on, on this, and he basically came out and said, look, we don't need, we don't need gold in this, in this um, scheme. Okay? We, just, we just need to use... Um, government securities, and to, to fix the price of gold. Right? So that, Friedman would be right, and the monetarists would be right to call that a price-fixing scheme. In fact, later on, I named it in price rule monetarism. It's, it's simply monetarism. Okay? Regular monetarism, the, t the brand that Milton Friedman promotes, is quantity rule monetarism. Under Friedman's um, scheme, you would simply increase the money supply at about 3% per year to try to keep the price level stable. Under price rule monetarism, you'd keep the price of gold fixed to try to keep the price level stable. Okay? So it was basically monetarism, which took into account the fact that the demand for money may change, which, which quantity rule monetarism doesn't take into account. And if the demand for money changes, well, then you're going to have a change in the price of gold. So, in fact, in Mark Miles' book on, on um, this, uh, he said, uh, we're, we're, just, we're a better brand of monetarism. Okay. The monetarists want to increase money supply at the same rate as the quantity of goods are increasing. But what if uh, the velocity of circulation is changing? Um, there's no way to, to adjust the quantity rule. But with a price rule, that would affect um, the price of gold, and we could react to it. All right, so it came down to basically giving, um, uh, coming up with a rule to kind of, like monetarism, to restrain a government monopoly. Okay. And, and any rule that you, you try to come up with to restrain a government mo monopoly is simply a pious wish. It's basically saying, please don't increase the money supply too fast if you're a monetarist, or please don't let the price of gold rise too high. There's nothing to stop the Fed from doing that. Okay? There are, people aren't there ready to turn in their dollars for gold like in the old days, causing the, 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 the Fed to fear, and the banking system to fear, they're, that they're going to they're lose their gold reserves. Okay? So those are the fake gold standards. Um, now, there was an interesting plan, I think which Guido Hulsman uh, uh, supports. Um, it was, I think it was maybe introduced by Henry Hazlitt. It was later picked up by Hans Sentholz and um, by Professor Timberlake, who I did criticize this morning. He actually um, 
was uh, at one time promoted this plan. I thought, you know, it's, it's a good, it's a step in the right direction away from monetarism. It's called parallel private goal standards, okay, or a parallel private goal standard. Basically, you don't get rid of, of the monopoly fiat money. What you do is you allow individuals, and you give them the means to make exchanges and contracts in gold. Now, how would that work? Um, and Hazlitt and, 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 and Senholtz's, and even I think in Timberlake's plan, you would abolish the Fed. Okay, you get rid of the Fed. Now, you wouldn't get rid of the Fed notes, and you wouldn't get rid of a fractional reserve banking. You'd simply abolish the Fed, which means that you could never have any further increase in bank reserves or currency. Okay? They would be frozen. Right? So you do get rid of. Um, uh, the agency that can increase these things, though, though the government, the Treasury could increase them if it wanted to, but okay, so you get rid of the Fed. And then you freeze, you freeze the monetary base, okay? There's no more Fed notes, there's no more uh, Fed deposits which are held by banks as reserves. All of that's gone. You then um, convert member bank reserve deposit accounts into Fed notes. In other words, uh, if your bank is holding a certain uh, amount of reserves as, as 10 percent backing for the checking deposits that you have, they would go and get Fed notes in return. So you got rid of the Fed deposits, you get rid of the Fed. The only reserve now is actual Fed notes, okay? And that's frozen. You can't change the number of them in the economy because there is no Fed to do that. Okay. Well, I, that, I like that. Um, you then, now the Treasury has 260 million ounces of gold, which it stole from the American people in, in two. Uh, in 1933, okay, when, when President Roosevelt forced all Americans to, to turn their gold in for, uh, uh, for, for Fed notes, you would either do one of two things. You would either give it away proportionally to uh, a proportional amount of this gold to each American citizen, which if, take an example, if you have 260 million citizens and there's 260 million ounces of gold, each person would get one ounce. Okay, or you could sell it. Okay, but whatever you do, you have to get it into private hands. You would then abolish legal tender laws. In other words, people uh, would no longer be forced to accept for their debts um, paper Fed notes. Okay, uh, and you would make gold clauses in contracts enforceable. So if myself and Simon made a contract in gold, okay, that. Um, I would pay him next week for that scarf, um, one tenth of an ounce of gold. I love that scarf. Um, anyway, uh, he, okay, and, and, and so, so he gave me the scarf, and then I was going to pay him a, a tenth of an ounce of gold next week. I could not come to him and say, I'm paying in dollars, in paper dollars, because they're legal tender. They're not legal tender any longer, so I can't force him to take them in payment, as you can today. And... Um, the, the gold clause is enforced. Now, according to Senholz, Hazlitt, uh, I think, I believe Guido, once you get rid of the legal tender laws and you get gold into people's hands, then you can have two monies. Then people can take the gold if they wish, and they can begin to um, deposit it in banks or have it minted privately and begin to use it. Now, I, I have an objection to this. I, I think it's a pretty strong objection. And Murray Rothbard has voiced an objection to, to this kind of a scheme. First of all, you get rid of the Fed. All right. The government can still, at some point, I mean, the people are still tied to these notes. These, these Fed notes are dollars, okay, in their minds. So um, if there is some sort of national emergency, quote, unquote, okay, if we expand the war on terrorism and they, and they, they want to finance a, a greater deficit, or if there's a recession for some reason and they want to um, uh, push down interest rates, they can, remember this is just paper, they can have Congress pass uh, you know, an emergency ex uh, exception to the rule that you, you have to have, that, that, that these liabilities have to be frozen and the, the Treasury can print them up and, and, and finance a deficit with them, okay? So you don't get rid of the dollar, but more importantly, you don't get rid of the paper dollar. But more importantly, if it actually be, begins to work and, and these things are frozen for a time, why would people use gold? They, you and I and, and, and businessmen and, and you know, everyone in the economy think, calculate, compare 
in terms of dollars. So if you go back to the regression theorem, okay, you somehow, if you want to get gold back into circulation as money and not just give it back to people, if you want to get it back into circulation as money, what you need to do is to make them think of gold as dollars again. How do you do that? You have to establish a link between the dollar and the gold. Under the parallel standard, all you do is have, you have gold over here and you still have these dollars that people have been using all along. Right? So that I th this is a potential problem with this. Okay? Now, I'm not as, you know, um, I, I'm still willing to entertain this as one way of going back because no one has come up, I think, with the perfect way of going back to gold. The way, this would work if we had a, a horrendous inflation. If we had a very, very bad you know, hyperinflation, then people would have the gold in their hands and they would be able to begin to use it in exchange. But the whole point is to freeze the Fed notes and not allow inflation any longer. So I don't see how you would get gold back into circulation. Now, very interestingly, some, some of the free bankers have said, you know, initially they said, well, we want free banking. The Austrian free bankers like George Selgin, Larry White, Steve Horowitz. Um, they initially said, we want gold as at the base of our free banking system. But then George Selgin said, you know what? Um, and I don't think the others have said this. We don't really need gold. If we get rid of the Fed and freeze the amount of paper dollars we have in the economy now, then they can serve as the base of the free banking system. Okay? So we just have this paper. And if they wear out, then the government will replace only the ones that wear out and so on. Okay. So the problem is that it ignores the regression theorem, it ignores the fact that people are, are love the dollar, are used to the dollar, and uh, compute and calculate and exchange in terms of dollars. And secondly, um, it, it, it still leaves the Fed notes in existence, which um, allows government at some point, because people believe it's money, to increase the money supply okay, by having the Treasury print up new um, Fed notes. All right. Let's take Ludwig von Mises' plan. Um, Ludwig von Mises uh, liked the currency school, but he just believed that they didn't go far enough. Remember, the currency school, what they wanted to do was, um, even though there were, there were unbacked notes in, 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 in circulation, they wanted any new note that came into circulation to be 100% backed by gold. Okay? But what they forgot was that checking account money is also um, part of the money supply. And banks can increase checking account money and cause business cycles that way. So von Mises recognized that, and he said he wanted a strict quant uh, currency school um, gold standard. Okay? He put forth a plan in 1953 for the United States okay, uh, in an epilogue to his book, Theory of Money and Credit. And in it, he said we, we, we should impose a 100% reserve on banks for all future checking account deposits um, and currency. If banks were allowed to issue uh, bank notes, that also would have to be 100% back. Okay? All new notes and all ch new checking deposits. Okay? Whatever was unbacked at the time of the reform can stay unbacked because it's really only the, the, the new injections of money into the system that, that pushes down interest rates and creates uh, the business cycle. He also, at the time, we, uh, Americans couldn't buy and sell gold. Uh, we only got that right back in 1976. But anyway, he wanted to reestablish the freedom of buying and selling gold. Once that was done, then there would be a gold market in the United States, as there is today, and we could see then what the price of gold would be. So after a period of time, okay, after, let's say, three months of a gold market, um, the U.S. government would announce that within another period of time, say within a, the, the, the month, any, uh, the dollar would be convertible at whatever the price of gold was after three months. So if it was $400 per ounce, then you would announce that in one month, Anybody who wants to can come to the bank and convert uh, dollars for gold at the rate of one four hundredth ounce of, of, of gold for a dollar. Okay, so, you, so banks would then be buying and selling gold. That would be a genuine gold standard. It would be a fractional reserve gold standard, but it would be a genuine gold standard. Um, he would establish a conversion agency, okay, not a central bank, but what he called the conversion agency, to buy and sell gold for dollars, okay? So actually, it wouldn't be the commercial banks initially that did it. It would be this conversion agency. Um, anyone who brought Fed notes to the bank or checks drawn on their, their checking account deposits at commercial banks, anyone who brought, brought these to the conversion agency, 
um, would receive gold coin at the rate of one ounce of gold coin to $400. Okay? Or if they wished, they could um, sell gold for $400 to the conversion agency. Uh, the Fed would not be, the Fed could still exist, but it would no longer be able to buy any more government bonds or securities. In other words, it could not print up money to um, perform open market operations with. Okay? Uh, he did, uh, for some reason, he didn't say that we should, we should get rid of the Fed. He said that the Fed could not interfere with the operations of the conversion agency. Um, he would also have withdrawn all small denomination bills from circulation. And I guess he meant $1 bills and $5 bills, maybe $10 bills. And they, would no longer, they could no longer be in circulation so that people would have to use gold for small purchases. So gold coins would be in people's pockets. Now, of course, at, at, at the price of gold as it is today, um, you know, that, that would really be impossible. I mean, you couldn't use gold for small purchases if, if an ounce is, is equal to $400, okay? Um, well, there's a couple, uh, again, this is a good plan. This, is a, a, this does not ignore the regression theorem. Now, there's a link. The dollar is one four hundredth of an ounce of gold. Okay, so there's a link between the dollar and gold. People can still think in dollars, but now their dollar is defined legally as a weight of gold. So I think it's better than the parallel standard um, that I talked gold, uh, parallel gold standard I talked about. Um, but it does leave the old Fed notes in existence, and, you know, again, the government can, can increase them. Okay. Uh, now, Rothbard, um, there's Rothbard 1 and there's Rothbard 2. There's two different plans that Rothbard puts forth. His newer plan is the following. Um, this, was, this came out in his book, The Case Against the Fed. What he says is that we should liquidate the Fed. We have to get rid of the Fed. Okay? We have to cancel um, it's, all its assets except the gold that it owns. And then we're going to reprice the gold. Okay? And the way we're going to determine the price of gold according to Rothbard would be to take the total amount of currency in the economy. And I just checked online today. Uh, at the end of, uh, on May 30th, okay, we had 707 billion dollars of currency in the U.S. economy, held by the public. Um, divide into that the ounces of gold owned by the Treasury, which is 260 million, okay, and that would give you a price of $2,272 per ounce, enormously higher than the market price. All right, well, I'll get to that point. But um, so what, then, what Rothbard would do is he'd abolish the Fed. Then you would call in all Fed notes. At least you get rid of the Fed notes, and um, people would bring their Fed notes in and exchange it for gold at that rate. Okay, you'd, uh, for every two thousand two hundred seventy-two dollars, you would get uh, an ounce of gold. Okay, um, so you and I would be able to do that as well as as the banks. The banks that that um, have um, reserve deposits at the Fed would also be able to turn them in for, um, for gold, okay? Well, not mel melting down, but just people from all over the world <laughs> would be coming to the U.S. Basically what would happen is that all this gold would flow into the U.S. and automobiles and everything else would flow out of the U.S., okay? Until there was an equilibrium reached, okay? Um, and so prices in the U.S. would rise rapidly to adjust to this very high price of gold. So that's one of the problems with this, this plan. Okay? But it would be a once-and-for-all inflation, and um, it wouldn't create a business cycle because it wouldn't be going on through the banking system. Right. So that's one of the problems um, with that. Now, faith, and, and it would leave fractional reserve banking. Okay? So... All the gold would either be held by people in their hands, okay, or would be deposited in the banks, and they could go on with their fractional res whatever fra reserves they, they wish to hold, they could hold. It would be a fractional reserve system still, okay. Demand deposits would not be 100% backed by gold. Only the, 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 the currency notes would be, would be um, transformed into gold itself, okay, so you get rid of the Fed notes, right. So if you wanted, so once you got your gold and you, and you deposit it in the bank, 
um, the bank wouldn't have to hold 100% reserves against your deposit. They could create checking accounts that were, let's say, 10% backed by um, gold dollars, okay, or whatever. There, wouldn't, there would no longer be a law limiting them to 10%, okay. Whatever they thought would be prudent would be what, what they would decide as the back, um, reserves. Rothbard's earlier plan would be to go back to a 100% gold standard, and what he you would have to do there is you would have to take the total amount of checking account money as well as currency, and that would determine what the price of gold was. And I looked again, I looked online, St. Louis Fed. Right now, M1 stands at. Let me put it up here. That um, M1, which is basically currency plus demand deposits, or your checking accounts, that's equal to 1,354 billion dollars. So basically, 1.3 trillion dollars. Okay. If you divided that, so point, I think it was, yeah, point five eight three. Divide that by the amount 260 million ounces of of um, gold, you come out with an enormously high price of $5,209 per ounce. Okay. But now, um, all Fed notes would be redeemed at that rate and Federal Reserve re uh, deposits, okay, um, as well as um, the uh, checking account money. Okay, so everything would be backed. Or, or, now, what would you do about savings accounts? <laughs> savings accounts could be turned into what they actually are. Um, really, they're a claim on the bank's assets, on the bank's loans. So you could, you, could, you could turn them into a form of mutual fund. You could separate the bank into a 100% warehouse in which any notes they issue must be 100% backed by gold. Any checking accounts they issue have to be 100% backed by gold. That would be, let's say, the um, deposit part of the bank. Okay? And on the other hand, you would have the loan part of the bank. Right? And there, all the bank's loans would be there, and people would own, their, their savings accounts would be turned into rights to, to, to um, uh, pro rata shares or pro rated shares of, of the bank's loans. Okay? And, and the same thing with their certificates of deposit. Okay? So um, they would become more like mutual funds. So the banks could take in money and loan it out, but they would only do that through their um, loan, loan department. Okay? The, that's what the currency school did. They, they separated the Bank of England into a deposit department. Uh, I'm sorry, into a um, yeah deposit. Or issue, they call it the issue department and a loan a loan department. Okay. So you'd have 100% back money, and you would still have banks able to um, uh, to accept um, investments or savings from uh, clients, and then to loan them out at interest and pay the clients interest in the same way that, that mutual funds do that. Okay. And money market mutual fund funds are not part of the money supply, and neither would be, be the, um, the, the, the loan banking operations. It wouldn't, wouldn't cause any inflation at all. Okay. Also, the, you then could abolish the FDIC because the banks are, all, all deposits are 100% backed. Um, there's 100% reserve um, banking. You would abolish the mint, okay, and have private mints minting coins. And... Um, you could, and you would transform the savings deposits either into mutual funds or you could tell people um, we're going to turn them into, into certificates, of, certificates of deposit. So, for example, if the banks, the average maturity of the bank's loans are, are nine months, then you would tell people, well, you can't, uh, you can't get your um, money out for nine months. Okay? And then, then they would know from then on that anything that they, they put in that interest into the uh, loan part of the bank would, would be in a certificate of deposit that would be a true investment. Okay? So you, you wouldn't have any um, inflation. Okay? Let me mention a, a plan that I recently um, came up with. Okay? In the old days, okay, um, some, for example, the U.S. after the Civil War in 1879, Great Britain in 1821 after the Napoleonic Wars, um, Great Britain again in 1925. 
they would go back to the gold standard by simply deflating the money supply and going back at some past price of gold, at some lower price of gold, okay, uh, than was, was uh, existing during the um, period of non-convertibility. Now, there was a problem because of unions in 1925, okay? There was no problem going back after the Civil War in 1879 or 1821. There was a little bit of a problem with the deflation, but it was nothing like it was in Britain in 1925. So all economists today look back at 1925 and say it's wrong to go back to the gold standard, even if you're a gold standard economist, uh, by deflating the, trying to deflate the money supply. Even Rothbard and Mises believe that. Okay, And let me just um, read you a little, or some comments by uh, Rothbard and Mises. Okay. Also, Hayek has the same view. Um, Mises opposed the deflationist policy and went on to argue that it was uh, erroneous, even in the case in which a country has, was attempting to revalue its depreciated currency in order to return to the gold standard at the previous mint par. Um, to avoid monetary contraction, Mises favored a restoration of gold parity at or near the currently prevailing price of gold. And we saw that was his plan. Okay, figure out what the price of gold is right now, and then let's go back. Um, even Murray Rothbard, although an enthusiastic proponent of bank credit deflation, that is, he likes when banks fail, and, that, and, and, and you get bank credit deflation, that is, a, a disappearance of these uh, uh, unbacked, um, unbacked bank deposits. However, um, he, he generally refrains from advocating a deliberate contraction of the money supply by the Fed, okay, um, under an existing fiat money regime. So, for example, he referred to, quote, the crucial British error and, quote, fateful decision of returning to the gold standard in the 1920s at the pre-war parity. For Rothbard, the, uh, quote, sensible thing to do would have been to recognize the facts of reality, the fact of the depreciated pound, franc, mark, and to return to the gold standard at a, re at a redefined rate, a rate that would recognize the existing supply of money and price levels, unquote. Um, additionally, in his proposals for the restoration of the 100% gold standard in, in, in the United States today, as I pointed out to you, a contraction of the supply of fiat dollars is avoided. Okay? He's not, he doesn't reduce, want to reduce the number of fiat dollars. He simply wants to increase the price of gold to back them up. But as we see, there are problems with increasing the price of gold to that great an extent. So, um, in thinking about this, um, I looked at another comment that Rothbard made that was very interesting. Um, in talking about the kind of deflation that he, he's willing to accept, which is when <coughs> banks fail. He doesn't want the, the, the Fed to bail them out. Okay? He doesn't want the Fed to, 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 to uh, contract the money supply deliberately, but if during a recession banks are failing, um, then allow that to happen and allow the money supply to fall. And, he, and, and so to defend this, he says, in a broad sense, this bank credit in contraction takes away from the original coercive gainers from credit expansion and benefits the original coerced losers. While this will certainly not be true in every case, in the broad sense, m much the same groups will benefit and lose, but in reverse order from that of the redistributive effects of credit expansion. Fixed income groups, widows and orphans, will gain, and businesses and owners of original factors previously um, reaping gains from inflation will lose. What does he mean by this? Well, as I showed you, um, according to Mises' step-by-step -step process, when you have inflation, those people who receive the money first, and they're usually uh, the government itself and its favorites in the economy, they benefit because prices haven't gone up yet, and people who receive the new money 18 months later or, or two years later are the ones that are hurt, especially people on fixed incomes who never get any of the new money because they have to pay higher prices during 18 months or they have to pay higher prices forever because they're on fixed incomes. What Rothbard says is, if you reverse that, or allow that to be reversed, um, if you suddenly have a deflation, then those people who lose the money first while prices are still high, they're the ones that lose. Okay? People on fixed incomes gain. The people who are hurt during the inflation gain during the deflation. Well, if that's true then, okay, if the welfare of those people who are coercively, um, coercively uh, expropriated by the inflation process, um, why not reverse the process so, um, and, and, and have the Fed do that? Now, so that 
if the Fed were to, to bring about a, a contraction of money, a slow contraction of money over time, you would have these welfare effects benefiting people that were hurt by the previous inflation. But also, you would lo lower the amount of dollars in the economy at the same time and make it easier to go back to gold at a lower price. All right, so um, let me just read you a little bit of, of my um, plan. Okay, and I, I, you know, again, I haven't thought, uh, you know, it's not completely thought through. I think a lot more has to be done on this. So I wouldn't stand by it as a plan that I would you know, want to implement. Um, so it says, in order to, uh, what I say is, in order to analyze the case within the context of contemporary institutions, it is necessary to provide some technical details of the relationship between the Fed and, and the Treasury. Um, basically, the Treasury maintains two types of deposits. It has deposits at commercial banks. Okay, When you pay your taxes, those taxes go to the commercial banks. And it has deposits at the Fed. When, when, when they want to spend, they use their deposits at the Fed. They write a check on the Fed to buy the things that the government needs. Right? Now, in between, when they take the money, the deposits, out of the commercial banks, and they put them in the Fed, guess what, what happens to the money supply? Well, because the, the banks lose reserves, uh, those reserves go back to the Fed, the money supply shrinks. Now, to prevent a deflation, what the Treasury does is to make sure that funds are flowing, that as they're taking funds out of the, uh, of the commercial banks to spend them through the Fed, the same amount of funds are flowing into the commercial banks, okay? So that the commercial banks' reserves don't fall. So they prevent a deflation. So my plan revolves around um, the Treasury allowing the, when they're spending money, allowing the reserves to decline and the money supply to shrink. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, let's say that you have uh, $1,000 of fiat money in the economy. It's all held in commercial bank demand deposits. And that the required reserve ratio is 10%. So in this economy, we have $1,000 of checking account money, that's the money supply, and $100 backing that up in the banks. Okay, so it's 10% reserves. If all banks are fully loaned out, they are holding $100 in required reserves um, in the reserve deposits at the Fed. When the Treasury shifts a surplus of, say, $20 to its general account at the Fed, it will leave the commercial banks with only $80. In other words, they have to pay the Treasury in their reserves. They have to, the reserves flow out. $20 of reserves flow out. So now they only have $80 of reserves, and um, they have to, to reduce the money supply by the same 20%. Reserves fall from 100 to 80, so the money supply has to fall from 1,000 to 800. They call in loans, okay? If you've had money in banking, you, you know how this works. Um, so what, what I advocate is that um, as this money supply sh shrinks, the Fed will then mandate an increase in the required reserve ratio to 12.5%, okay? And simultaneously, the Treasury will spend its surplus funds by transferring them to the reserve deposits of the commercial banks, uh, uh, permitting them to meet the new reserve requirements with total bank reserves once again equal to $100. In other words, what would happen is that this would shrink. This is at the money supply. Okay, it would shrink from a thousand. Okay, to um, that's in time t o. In time t one, it would be 800. Okay, if this is the reserves. The reserves would, would shrink initially from 100 to 80, but then the money would be spent and would get back into the, 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 um, the commercial banks. But we don't want them to use that extra $20 in the multiple deposit expansion to increase the money supply back to 1,000. So the Fed would increase the reserve requirement up to 12.5%, meaning that now $80 um, would, would uh, or rather $100 would be necessary as that money gets back, in, after it's spent, it, get back, it gets back into the, um, it, get back, it, it gets back into the, uh, the, the, the commercial banks. Okay, so um, this could be, you know, I'll just take it a few more rounds. This could continue to happen. The Fed will then mandate, um, In the following year, the, so you can do this you know, each year. In the following year, the Treasury again runs a surplus of $20. Okay, so this is a fiscal deflation. What it's doing is it's deflating, okay, which at the new higher purchasing power of money exceeds in real terms the prior year's surplus. Okay, so in the prior year, the, the surplus was $20. 
Um, but now, since prices are lower, since you have a lower money supply, you have a, a greater real surplus. Following the same procedure of disposing of the fiscal surplus, the money supply shrinks by another 20%. So now it's down to $640. Okay? Um, the Fed then raises the required reserve ratio to about 15%. So that the hundred dollars now supports six hundred and forty dollars, and so on. So you can continue to, to reduce the money supply at, at some maybe a slow rate year after year, okay? And that would mean that there are less dollars to back by gold. So when you go back to the gold standard, that would imply that you could go back at a lower gold price. Now, what's the problem? This has a problem too. The problem is, can we depend on the Fed? to continue to engage in this policy of slowly contracting the money supply, especially when we know that <clears throat> it's going to bring about a temporary recession. Okay? Initially, it'll bring about a recession. But as people get used to the, and, and businesses get used to the slowly falling prices that will result, the, the, the depression will, will, will um, there'll be a recovery in the economy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, my worry is that the Fed will say, oh, we have a recession, um, you know, we have to stop this program and, um, so it's the length of the program that, that's a problem, right? Um, there, there's another possible solution here, and I'll just mention it and then end, and that is the, um, in Argentina, when Argentina had problems with its currency um, board, okay, um, back in, in, 19, in, in the late 1990s, early um, early 2000s, what happened was Argentina had approximately $70 billion worth of pesos and dollars. Okay? Now, remember Argentina backed their peso with American dollars. So whether you had a dollar checking account, which you could have in Argentina, or a peso checking account, the uh, Argentine central or the Argentine um, currency board had to pay off in dollars. But there was only five billion dollars because of, of, of the massive inflation that had gone on. There was only five billion dollars backing up the seventy billion dollars of deposits. Okay, so you have your much greater deposits. Well, my recommendation, which I had written up um, for an, uh, an Indian journal, um, was this: give people back. Okay, now what, what did the, the Argentine government, in this case dollar standard, right? And at the same time, you have a situation where banks, when those, that money is put back into banks, have to back it up by 100%, okay? If, if, if you put, they put them back in the checking accounts. Um, and, and as I said, the, the savings component, or the investment component of the bank's portfolio, whatever it doesn't have in reserves, turn that over to the people in the sense that make it into a mutual fund. Okay, the bank is bankrupt. The shareholders should have nothing. They should have no assets. All those assets should go to the people. Okay, all right. So then I'll stop there and take about one or two questions. Yes. <clears throat> On your first uh, about the balance sheet of the gold standard, mm -hmm. I would add number seven. <clears throat> A friend of mine said, "Well, the problem with the gold standard, gold fluctuates too much in value." So I okay. tried to explain uh -huh. to him, no, it wasn't the gold. It was it's the paper money. It's because gold, isn't, because gold isn't money, that the paper money is changing in value, and people are using gold as a hedge, and the price of gold is going up and down. Once you link the dollar to gold, then gold is the money. And, and it's simply the supply and demand for money that determines the value of gold at that point. And there, you know, it doesn't fluctuate wildly at all. Because the supply of, of gold doesn't change very, very rapidly, as we know. And people's demand for gold, if they trust the money, that doesn't change very rapidly. It changes every year as, as the economy grows. Okay, it changes slowly, and prices slowly fall. But, but the value of gold doesn't change under a gold standard. It changes under a paper standard. Yes? Uh, the people, it seems to me, in the uh, European Union countries, mm -hmm. switched over from their, from their local currency to the uh, euro pretty readily, I think. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure of that. Yes. But uh, you seem to be concerned about people's ability to change from dollars to ounces of gold. Well, Mostly. that's a very good question. The, 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 the reason why they did is because it, it didn't contradict the regression theorem. The euro, there, w there was an exchange rate between the euro 
and each individual currency. So, in other words, the euro was based on 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 the, on the various national currencies, okay? And there were fixed exchange rates, so you easily passed from, let's say, the franc to the euro. Okay. Uh, but if you just put 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 euros into circulation, you know, print them up, and there was no exchange rate. Okay, transitional exchange rate to the, the existing currencies, no one would accept the euro. Now, with gold, it's a little bit better because gold you know, is bought and sold in terms of dollars. But my concern is that people are not going to calculate in ounces of gold. They don't look on it as money. Okay? Um, you know, people, anyone who remembers gold as actual in, actually in circulation, if, if there is anyone, is a very small proportion of the population. Um, so, not having had recent experience with gold as money, people will still look on paper dollars as money. And I don't think they're going to take this gold that they're given or, or sold and put it in banks and start gold banks and so on. I think they're going to continue to operate in dollars. That's why I think the parallel gold standard um, will not come into operation. It's a good start because you get rid of the Fed, you um, freeze the amount of dollars and so on, uh, you get gold back in the hands of people, but um, it's better than what we have, but I, I think we might be able to do better. Okay. Yes. I think that's more difficult. I mean, if the Fed, the Fed goes, it's one institution, it, it goes. But they don't, they don't run into the Fed. They don't use the Fed uh, as an institution on a daily basis. They do use um, dollars on a daily basis. And I think psychologically that means a lot. Okay. Now, we're just trying to get this... I mean, there's a second problem, which I won't go into, but we're just trying to figure out the best theoretical way to go back, given our institutions. Then there's the political problem. Okay, that, that's a separate issue, which, you know, you can write a lot on that. But I think we ought to get straight what the best practical way to go back is if there were no political barriers. Okay, okay I'll stop here. Thanks.